COP26 is over, but the energy transition is still firmly on the agenda. Governments across the world have set quite ambitious targets to reach by 2030. Now, Battersea Power Station behind me is one of the UK's most iconic examples of this transition to clean energy. In 2020, it reopened as a low carbon energy hub, and that's 38 years after it closed its coal power productions. One thing's for sure, the demand for clean energy is only going to increase. But what we want to know is by 2030, what will energy look like? And also along the way, what sort of obstacles do we need to overcome? Mark Lacey has more for us on this in the next video. The climate crisis is here. It's upon us. It's happening. We owe it to future generations to build back better and base our recovery on solid foundations, including a fairer, greener and more resilient global economy. Global recognition of the need to transition to clean energy is stronger than ever, and the urgency around this is growing. The collective aim is to limit global temperature rises to just 1.5 degrees, which in theory means we need to reduce emissions by at least 33% over the next nine years. So we've made very, very good progress, but over the next few years, we expect government policy to become even more in line with regard to net zero targets. Because at the moment, investment rates are just not enough. And actually, if you look across every single element of the energy transition, whether it's clean energy generation, transmission and distribution, clean mobility, which includes charging infrastructure, and even hydrogen networks, the investment rates are nowhere near what we need to get to for 2030 and 2050 net zero targets. If investment rates increase, where should we expect to see the biggest material changes in our energy supply? We expect to see material changes initially in the energy generation space. So what do I mean by that? I mean that wind and solar, we're going to see investment rates pick up considerably. And that you'll really start to see the benefits of that towards the end of this decade. But if we look longer term, more broadly, it's hydrogen networks which are really needed to basically decarbonise industry, decarbonise mass goods transportation, and obviously inner city transportation. That's where we'll really start to see those benefits between 2030 and 2050. And that's what's needed in order to meet net zero targets. There can be no doubt the future of transportation in our nation and around the world is electric. We will put a price on pollution and we will make sure that the energy we use is clean. As demand increases, prices are driven down. But over time, this demand could overwhelm traditional infrastructures. We've already seen massive cost reduction in wind and solar, and that's come down considerably over the last decade. And that's essentially allowed the fast rollout of these technologies to replace coal. With regards to the EV infrastructure, it's absolutely critical that this needs to be built out before we see the consumer take up of electric vehicles. But it's not just the charging infrastructure, it's the transmission and distribution networks which are needed to facilitate this change. And this is a key area where we expect a lot of investment over the next decade. The energy transition is well underway, but the question is whether decision makers and government policy can keep up with the pace of change in order to meet the deadline of 2030. Mark joins me now in Battersea. So Mark, you've made the case for this transition to happen as soon as possible. But can we expect every region to transition at the same pace? When you look at emerging markets versus developed markets, if you look in the past on emerging markets, certainly over the last two decades, they've been growing their power consumption a lot faster rate than developed markets for obvious reasons. They're developing. And now they have this fantastic opportunity as they grow into those power markets to actually bring in wind and solar power in order to facilitate that. So they're, they're cleaning up their own power mix while at the same time basically fulfilling that demand need that's basically needed. Don't expect the same principles to occur though in charging infrastructure. For charging infrastructure, the developed markets are going at a much, much faster pace because they have access to EVs and obviously the infrastructure is being put in in an earlier place, particularly in Europe. So we expect a slight lag there because of that dependency on oil in particular in those emerging markets. And do you think there's anything that developed countries could be doing to help the developing countries? Do we have a part to play here? So 
People are looking at country to country, and obviously COP26, you saw an agreement for 100 billion per annum of funding. 100 billion per annum of funding for emerging markets isn't really a lot, but where most of the funding comes from, develop companies moving into emerging markets. This is the most important thing because those countries are looking for local content, and that's where you get that direct investment with those companies going in, and that actually boosts the local economy in those, in those areas. And then, Alongside all of this, obviously, companies are racing to innovate and make the most of these opportunities. But is there a particular country or region that you think is going to be the front runner here? So Europe in particular has been the big front runner so far, particularly with the Euro Green Deal, setting the framework and policy, making it a lot easier for companies to invest, because that's essentially what government policy sets. It sets the framework. China is a huge part of this as well with regards to the infrastructure and also this, as equipment supplies into this market, they are actually continue to bring the cost down aggressively, whether it's solars or whether it's electrolyzers, obviously in the hydrogen market. Um, all these components, China has a huge influence on the whole industry bringing down the cost side. And then the last part is obviously the US. The US is going to be a huge part in terms of providing investment and local infrastructure as well to really accelerate this entire change. Thanks, Mark. So that covers the energy transition at quite a high level. But we're also interested in finding out a bit more about the impact on individual households and investors. Alex Monk has more on this in the next video. New buildings must provide electric car chargers across England from 2022. How the energy transition could impact you and me is a topic high on the news agenda. But what sort of changes should we expect by 2030? So the first area where we're seeing significant change at the household level is at the driveway. Already 20% of all new vehicles sold in the UK are electric and sentiment towards electric vehicles is massively increasing. But it's not only about our cars. On average, over the course of a year, one electric vehicle uses as much electricity as a house. So in order to keep the lights on, we're going to need to massively change the infrastructure around our electric vehicles too. Now that not only means new electric vehicle charging points in the home, but also changing the wider infrastructure around the grid so that we can better balance supply and demand as our energy transition unfolds. By 2030, it's inevitable that the charging infrastructure and the grid network will have been through some upgrades. But the changes don't stop on the driveway. We want to have every home in the UK powered by clean, renewable wind energy uh, by 2030. The second area where we're seeing significant change is in our heating. We need to make our heating electric, and governments around the world are already starting to make significant changes by here. For example, in the UK, by 2050, all new homes will require electric heat pumps as opposed to the gas boilers we're used to today. The UK Prime Minister's 10-point plan set out an ambition to install 60,000 heat pumps per year by 2028. But this will be an extra challenge in older homes. Now, retrofitting existing homes is a much harder problem to solve. And it's really important because 85% of all our homes today use gas boilers. Now, one potential solution here is to use green hydrogen produced from renewables. Now, while this technology is a long way off, there are various projects up in the north of England creating hydrogen towns that are starting to experiment here. And it's definitely a potential solution that we may be able to use in time. Alongside upgrades in technology, there needs to be significant developments in storage if we plan to run everything using renewables in the future. Imagine a home in 2030 where you have an electric vehicle, a charging point and a heat pump slash hydrogen hybrid boiler. Those technologies are being powered by solar energy produced from solar panels on your roof and storage in your garden. And when they're not producing enough solar, you're going to be using renewable energy and hydrogen from the grid. And then when the grid can't produce enough electricity, we might be taking some of the electricity that's stored in our vehicles today and powering it back into the grid to keep the whole system going. We ultimately need to change the entire way with which we produce, distribute and consume energy within the home. And that's going to be super important as our energy transition unfolds. Significant investment and government support are needed to achieve these aims by 2030. And change is needed across the whole value chain. But if predictions are correct, then we may be about to experience the fourth industrial revolution. Thanks for watching.